world currency. The new world order. Those are the roots of trouble. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hmm? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from FederalJack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another live edition. It is Wednesday, May 14th, 2014. Tonight, I am pleased to bring back to my broadcast... The first time here since I've been on True Frequency, but not the very first time ever on this broadcast. And you have to go back and listen to my archives over on federaljack.com, as I always tell you. But my guest tonight is a good friend of the broadcast. And I have to tell you, he has been a supporter of Federal Jack and a supporter of mine for a very, very, very long time. A very loyal supporter. In fact, when I started selling those hard drives that I sell, the, the, now they're up to like four terabyte drives. He was one of the first people that actually purchased one, and without even me asking him to, and this was years ago, he made uh, a YouTube commercial for me, for them, which actually helped me uh, get the idea of what I was doing out there. And he didn't have to do that. He just you know, did it because he's that kind of individual. That's why I'm psyched to have him on tonight. I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction about him, and then I'm going to bring him up. And he does his own radio uh, broadcast, too, on Thursdays, which... I urge you to download the archive to your phone, whatever, MP3 player, your computer, as I always tell you, and listen to it about your daily routine. Because I know nobody has time. Some people have time to listen live, but a lot of people don't. So as I always tell people, rip the archives. So let me tell you a little bit about my guest tonight. His name's Andrew Steele, and he does a lot of stuff, ladies and gentlemen. He, he's got his own website. He's got his own radio show. But he also does a lot of volunteer work for architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. A lot of work for them. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of background information on him and a little bit about what he does for architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, and then I'm going to bring him up, and we're going to get right into it. So he was, back before uh, 9-11, he was, he spent a summer as a guest English teacher at a Chinese university, and uh, about a week later, after he came back from that experience, 9-11 happened, and... Um, he received an email from somebody that he knew, a friend of his uh, in China, suggesting even back then, I know the crazy conspiracy theorists, right? Oh, they, it took them years to come up with this stuff. No, I mean, within days, there were people saying um, something ain't right. In fact, that day, people were saying something ain't right, even beforehand. But anyway, I digress. So he got an email saying, hey, this ain't right. And he did what I did, the same thing, kind of blew it off. And then... He was teaching English in Uzbekistan as a Peace Corps volunteer in between 2004 and 2005. 
and he organized his first to fifth grade students to pick up trash in their neighborhood. And apparently this upset local government officials because it made them look bad. And between that, you know, de- experiencing that, even something that low level can open your eyes. And then there was an uprising while he was there. It changed his worldview. And then he came back here and he started to realize that the war on terror as a response to 9-11 was killing a lot of civilians with drone strikes and all these illegal wars and he started to question things obviously his website his original website by the way uh, is america 20 xy and as far as i know america 20 xy.com is still up but I'll, I'll ask andy when i bring him up in a second um and he's been a regular contributor to the alternative media since he's just he's one of these people that you really um not many people might have might know about him or heard about him but he's responsible for a lot of the stuff that you see He's one of these behind-the-scenes guys that doesn't get enough credit, and I think he deserves a lot of credit. He also helped organize the January 2013 facts to all 12,000 police chiefs and sheriffs in the country outlining the evidence of controlled demolition at the World Trade Center on 9-11. He encourages citizens to talk to elected officials on C-SPAN's morning call-in show, which he himself goes around making sure that there are people to call in because the numbers get blocked by C-SPAN after they call in. Every time you see one of these videos on Mox News, the YouTube channel, of a C-SPAN guest getting hammered with 9-11 truth questions like WTC7 and stuff, that's because of Andy. He's doing that stuff behind the scenes. He's rallying the troops. He's a general in his own right. He deserves enough attention, uh, and he's, he's not getting enough, at least in my opinion. So he deserves more than he's getting, I should say. So let me bring him up so you guys can hear what he has to say. Andy, welcome back to the broadcast. Oh, thanks for having me back on. It's a very nice introduction here, but I think I, I think I get uh, enough attention, and there's so many people out there doing so much work that you never even hear about at Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, and not just within that organization, but just the folks out there doing whatever they can. The guy that goes out and hands out materials uh, near what, what used to be Ground Zero, um, on the weekends, you know, you don't hear about. There's so many people that just get, were inspired with having the same kinds of ideas. I think there's almost something miraculous in that kind of a field of dreams moment for for America right now. So that's how I know I'm in the on the right side of history, and so are all of your listeners that uh, tune into your show to hear about what's really going on in this world. Well, you're just an all-around awesome guy, dude. I've known you for a long time, and uh, I appreciate all the work that you do, especially all the activism you do. I want to hop right into it. This C-SPAN thing that you do, tell the listeners what gave you the idea, like what inspired you to do it, and then break it down for them so they know how they can do it too, and when to, you know, so they can almost be like autonomous, so they know when to look and know when these guests are coming on and to call in as well. Sure. Um... Uh, some of the things I'll have to, in terms of how it's organized, I'll, I'll keep uh, silent for now just for operational security. But I'm going to start backwards with that question and, and tell your listeners how they can do it. I mean, the simplest way to do it is uh, you go to cspan.org the night before and see who's going to be on the program. And if it's somebody that you can even relate 9-11 to in the slightest way, and I'll elaborate on that in just a moment, uh, you call them in the morning. They flash the numbers up. Um, I, I, I will... Get it up at my website, 911freefall.com. Uh, get the numbers up for everybody to copy down. They may change them sometime, but then you just get the new numbers, and you simply uh, call in. Uh, with regard to getting uh, beyond the screener, um, I, if you say that you want to talk about Building 7 or or uh, 9-11 Truth, uh, they would probably hang up on you. So uh, the best way to do it is related to whatever idle chit-chat topic that they're discussing, or even if it's an important topic, you can still relate it. If they're talking about foreign policy, you can relate that, obviously. Civil liberties, very easy to relate that. Um, there was one gentleman who called in. I didn't have anything to do with it. They were talking about federal funding for bike trails or some something like that. And the first thing that he said was, I, you know, I just want to say that uh, bicycling is the cheapest form of travel that there is. And then he said, and my, my, I just want to add to that, have you been uh, threatened and that's why you won't talk about uh, Building 7? And it was, I mean, it was a funny uh, sound bite and they got it on for the day, so good for that guy. And he was 100% accurate because bicycling is one of the cheapest uh, forms of travel that there is. So good there. But that's really all you got to do. The important thing is to let the public know, the 3 million listeners that they 
claim to have watching them, I believe that's what I, I read on their site, uh, to let them know that this is not just some small group of five or six people. This is America. The greater majority of America knows there's something wrong with the story that they were told about 9-11, even if they haven't gone to controlled demolition or inside job. They know now seeing the after effects of 9-11, seeing the post-9-11 world unfold before them, seeing all the stuff that the conspiracy theorists, quote-unquote conspiracy theorists, said was going to happen, starting to happen, not just starting to happen, I mean, in in pretty good uh, progress happening, they know there's something wrong, and the emotion is worn down. Here we are in, in 2014, it's more than a decade behind us. People can look at this more rationally now, and they can start to trust their own common sense. So this is the time to let them know that America is questioning this. And what you also do is if you get in on a guest, they bring on some government uh, uh, person to talk about you know, how we need to uh, put sanctions on Iran, for instance, because they're not bowing to our will. What you do is you graffiti their message that they're trying to propagandize the American public with, with the words, remember building seven. No matter how you put it, when you remind people of Building 7 in the middle of this, you remind the 3 million viewers that these people that they're watching on television have lied before. They're probably lying to you now again. And and it's also fun, too, because when you ask the questions very directly um, and don't give them any wiggle room, it's funny to see some of their reactions. I mean, the, the hosts have now, uh, I mean, they're at their wit's end. They're getting to the point where they're cutting off people even before they say Building 7, where where it sounds like they're about to say Building 7. That's going to be in the next compilation video that comes out. It's really just uh, kind of crazy to, to watch the paranoia um, uh, of these folks. They don't want it on their show. And, and you know, I've had people kind of, friends and and, and folks kind of make jokes like, why are you so obsessed with getting it on C-SPAN? You know, why, why C-SPAN? Well, first of all, with C-SPAN, and, and let me just uh, specify it, Washington Journal program in the morning, that's what we're really talking about. Um, this is a program that lets you have access to the people that are supposedly in power, your politicians, your think tank folks uh, who are advising them. Uh, uh, gov- other kind of government agents, you know, folks like that. That's this is where you have the closest access to them because anybody that's done this kind of activism for any length of time, like for instance, I went and met with my uh, congressman's office. I didn't get to actually meet with my congressman uh, to discuss 9-11 uh, controlled demolition evidence. He don't want to hear it. So you meet with some representative of his office who's paid essentially to make you feel good about yourself for the half hour time that you have Tell you, tell you that they're going to look into it, and then you get a letter back later saying, yeah, we're not going to do anything. Um, so the, the politicians are protected by this invisible, spongy membrane of emails and chit-chat. You really can't get at them with, with these important uh, controversial issues. But on Washington Journal, you absolutely can because not only can you talk to them, you're talking to them right on television. And a mistake that I've always watched people make over the years when I'd be watching this program is that they want to, you know, they're so excited to, to have this chance that they're on TV is that they'll fill it with all these different points about, you know, 500 different subjects to lay out in, in points. And what will happen is that the guests will, they'll talk about one topic. It'll be the easiest topic uh, that they can that they can kind of uh, dance around, and then they'll avoid all of the other uh, more crucial, more hard-to-address topics. So the, this is why the scientific evidence of 9-11 is so important, because it's basic physics, it's common sense, top part of a building can't crush the lower part without slowing down. Um, you know, I, Even if you're a politician, you should be able to understand that. And when you put them on the spot and don't ask anything else other than the questions like that, uh, that's when you get the interesting reactions. And the audience is beginning to see now that feigning outrage and, and uh, getting emotional and being mad that you were even asked the question is not addressing the question. Um, and actually, I just uh, uh, called into the show on Friday because a lot of times now the host will say when, when, when uh, a caller calls in with this, uh, building seven question. They they try all these different kinds of responses and see if it'll stick. The latest one has been, we, well, we've covered that. And I pointed out to them that cutting somebody off and calling them a conspiracy theorist when they can't defend themselves or uh, rebut it is really not 
covering it. And I also asked Peter Sloan, because I happen to know that architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth reached out to C-SPAN back in September and said, you know, we'd be willing to come on the program and even have a debate with somebody advocating the official story just about the building destructions. And they never responded to it. So I essentially asked the host, um, why didn't you uh, take him up on that offer? And, of course, his only response to me was, well, well, thank you for your uh, your views, Bert. That was the, the pseudonym I was using that day. But, uh, they, but because they can't address it. They can't uh, go into why they don't want to cover it. I have my own personal views on that. Obviously, I can't speak for what's in people's heads. It might have something to do with the fact that they might have a more difficult time getting interviews with Barbara Bush or, or Laura Bush for their uh, sentimental uh, programs that they put on at night, like the First Lady series, things like that. But also, too, this is a highly controversial topic, and they rely on the complete cooperation of uh, the Washington establishment uh, to to put on a show every day. And when the congressmen are coming on and they know now that they are going to get a question about this, that kind of hinders their uh, their ability to get these interviews, I, w- I would think. Obviously, I'm not on the inside, but I know that the congressmen are being warned about that. We had one congressman, I, I can't remember which one, but uh, it's I believe it's in one of the latest compilation videos, who said he was warned that he might get a Building 7 question. Now, I don't know who warned him, if it was Washington Journal or if it was an aide of his, but the fact that he's being warned that he's probably going to get one of these questions is a sign that we as a movement are winning, and and especially even through this campaign, because now they have to at least talk about it. Even if they have to talk about how they're going to avoid talking about it, they still have to talk about it. And so a lot of these congressmen who never even heard of Building 7 before suddenly now need to know what it is and this is one of those things i've used this analogy before on my show like boxing you know if you're fighting up against somebody and it's kind of you can't get that knockout shot they're covering up it's a strong opponent um and you know you can keep on trying to swing for that face and and leaving yourself vulnerable and tire yourself out or you can just punch on his arms now what's going to happen is initially you're not going to get that knockout shot but eventually as you're pounding on his arms those arms are going to get sore and they're going to start falling and then the punches that he throws at you are going to get weaker and weaker and then you, uh, you you soften them up for later. And then later on, you might start getting that knockout uh, shot, uh, that, ch- that chance to, to punch them out and win the fight there. So so these things, even though it might seem like, oh, my God, okay, I called him the C-SPAN and this guy hung up on me. What good was it worth? Well, it, it does a lot of good because you're one more person in this kind of invasion force. And this is what they don't like. They're happy uh, or... or I shouldn't even use the word happy. They're content with letting us talk amongst each other on the Internet, letting a bunch of uh, conspiracy theorists, quote-unquote, the, 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 the label they try to uh, put on people who talk about common sense and physics, letting us talk with each other on the Internet but not actually take it to their world. Well, when you do things like this, when you call into talk radio, when you confront these uh, politicians and, and uh, media uh, reality makers – Uh, on their own territory, you are taking ground in this metaphorical war that they started. And so uh, this makes them nervous. But this is how progress needs to happen. So everything that you do is going to help out in in getting justice in the end on this issue and on so many other issues because 9-11 is the gateway to so many other important issues too. So you should never feel like your efforts are, are for nothing. As long as you are fighting, as long as you're creating friction, you are doing something important for the cause and for the world. I agree. I mean, people need to step up and do things. Uh, a, it inspires others, if nothing else. It inspires others to do things. You know how many people see those videos, especially when Mox puts them up on his YouTube channel? And uh, they they don't know who those callers are. They don't know the story behind it. But they see other Americans standing up and saying, um, "9/11, the official version, is a lie," and you need to go check out Building Seven. I mean, you you could try to throw straw man arguments and logical fallacies all day long. They're not answering the questions. It's as simple as that. And when they go out of the way to censor you guys calling in, like you said, they block people's numbers as soon as they call in. That's why you have to have new people with from new numbers call in all the time. Yeah, it, it's crazy, and there's you know that's a new development that's uh, that's come up, and and I, I suspect that that that's happening because there's people who've tried to call in a second time who are are very reliable, and uh, it started to happen on a trend that I believe that that might be happening with uh, 
uh, on their end and one of those desperate attempts. So, so how do I get on so much? Well, I've got my own way of doing it, um, a little trick that I do that not everybody can do because it costs me a, a little bit of a – little tiny bit of money to do it so i'll keep that to myself uh for operational security so i can get on but yeah most your average person that's just kind of stepping up to help at this moment uh can only do it once so you make it count and you make it uh good and pick you pick the time that you want to do it that i'm not saying that to discourage anybody from doing it however uh maybe you will be able to get it get through twice uh if you want but basically uh yeah the important thing is to just like I, like I said earlier is to create that friction and uh, get the message out there however you can. It's like having a commercial for Building Seven, um, and uh, it, when when that gentleman walked up to the microphone at the Super Bowl and said 9/11 was an inside job and it was done by people in our own government, and that created created such a stir on the internet and a 9/11 blogger they posted it. And my joke was that. Uh, that uh, usually Super Bowl ads cost millions of dollars. We got this one for free. So it, I mean, so there's nothing that the establishment can do when people just decide that they're going to start pushing back, and that's what really frightens them. I, th- I almost feel that they put out this stuff about how much they're spying on you and how much of a, a police state it's becoming to try to scare you, to that you're going to be put on this – unknown, unseen list somewhere and that uh, you're going to be doomed for life. It's like the uh, grown-up equivalent of the, your permanent record in school. Now, my attitude is, well, put me on your list. I don't care. I consider being on that list a badge of honor. They should publish that list in a Hall of Fame of all the great patriots that are are stepping up someday right now. So I'm not afraid of it. And when you're not afraid and you push back, then you see how much you, you see the other side for what it really is. When you see that fearful look cross, uh, for instance, on C-SPAN's Washington Journal, when you see that fearful look cross one of these hosts' face, you see them for what they are, and they are no longer this uh, this. You know, entity called the mainstream media that seems like some kind of impossible juggernaut to overcome. Because regardless of all their technology and all of the power that they try to project through the uh, the appearance they they uh, put on or the airs that they put on and the um, news stories that they report, they're really just human. And humans can be brought down. It's kind of like Rocky IV. Uh, to use a movie analogy when he's getting batted around and then he reaches out and, and swings one punch and the, the Russian gets cut. And he's kind of horrified by it, the Russian, as he goes back to his corner and his trainer tells him, see, he's cut. He's a man. All right? He can bleed. He's just a man. He's not a machine. Well, the same thing goes with these people. These are just people. And they're working it within a rigid frame uh, of... Uh, of operation, where you know they have to kind of follow certain rules and 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 have to keep up an image. You really don't. You need you should need to be factual and make sure you know what you're talking about. But as long as you tell the truth, uh, you really don't have all the baggage that they do. So they're at the disadvantage. We're at the advantage. We just need to understand that and step up and speak out. And it's really not a lot of work. It's actually pretty simple, and it's a lot of fun. And it's not just with C-SPAN, but in any way that you feel you can get your voice out there. There's zillions of ways I, I, I know that I have not thought of, that other people have not thought of, that you can think of. And we all have talents. We all have something to bring to the table. Well, you need to bring it right now because history is calling – you. Um, this is like the second American Revolution taking place, and the good thing is, is that it's a peaceful revolution. We don't have to go uh, freeze our butts off in the snow and, and shoot at people to make it happen. It's a revolution of thought, because a lot of people think when you talk revolution that you're talking about a war. You're actually the revolution happens in your mind. Wars sometimes follow them uh, when they try to put down the revolution and thought when the the current order tries to uh, protect itself. But the real revolution happens in your mind, and that's really what we're in right now. And I really think that 9-11 Truth, uh, waking up to what really happened to the buildings in New York, facing uh, the basic physical realities of that day, is going to be good for the United States of America. It's going to make us a better nation. How great a story would it be in our history for people in the future to look back at this time and say, wow, within a v- relatively short amount of time, I know it seems like a long time because it's our lives, but really in the big scheme of the world, it's not a long time at all. How awesome was it that these people stood up 
and and expose this that these people restored America and were able to overcome this huge psyop that was done on them and how much would that scare not just uh, any kind of future leaders in America from ever trying to uh, attempt something like this again but just world leaders in general how much would that scare them from ever trying to do something like what we saw in 9-11 I think it would set tyranny back on its ear for hundreds of years at least so I mean this is an important thing you're doing so everything you do is is a critical strike in this war for America's future not just America's future though for the world well said uh, and I, I completely agree that you know every little step counts every little fight counts every little even if it's the tiniest of battle and you think well I got hung up on I only got built check out building seven and then they hung up and the, and the per- person goes well I didn't really do anything yes you did you helped expose that there's something they don't want everybody to know because they wouldn't act like that if they had nothing to hide it's that simple okay it, it, it's if they had just like they say to you well if you, if you got nothing to hide you then what do you care well we should reverse that on them and if you got nothing to hide what do you care why do you keep hanging up on people and like you said no c-span does not do adequate coverage of it if they did adequate coverage they would have you know richard gage and the crew down there doing video presentations once a month that would be adequate coverage. I mean, the amount of propaganda they spew out compared to only telling truth once a month, I think that's about fair. But, you, you know, you'll never see that. C-SPAN, as much as people say, well, it's paid for by taxes, yeah, but it's run by the government. So anything, if, if, you, if, if you're controlled by the government, whether it's literally people in there or by the purse strings, you're screwed. So I'm going to cut us off right there, Andy, because we got the brakes sneaking up. Ladies and gentlemen, do not go anywhere. More 9-11 truth when we get back. Stay tuned. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Talking to Andy Steele tonight. Andy, before I forget, because we're going to get into conversation, and I know how I am, uh, and you know how I am because you've been on before and you've chatted with me off air plenty of times. Um, Let's plug all your websites, your radio show, any Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, anything before we forget. Go ahead and throw it out there. All right, the show is called 911 Freefall. It's on noliesradio.org. That's how the website is laid out. noliesradio.org every Thursday night at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific. Now that might be tough for people to uh, to get in front of the computer at that time each night. So I archive it. It's archived over at noliesradio.org. I also archive it at YouTube. So pass around the videos, get the view counts up. Um, you can also keep up at, with the show at 911freefall.com. It's uh, really just an archive of the show also, but I also put up stories there occasionally when something interesting happens with C-SPAN or, or whatever with 911 Truth. So 911freefall.com. Also, of course, you can keep up on what a AE- 911 Truth is doing by going to ae911truth.org. If you uh, go to the page on the uh, where is it? oh on the right hand side among all the tabs it says join the team volunteer. We always need volunteers. If you want to think of this as a metaphorical war and and keep that uh, that that line of thought going. Well, we need people on the front line. So if you got any talent, anything to bring to the table, click that tab, fill out a short form, and then someone will get back in touch with you. And you'll be uh, part of the team. Um, and I also just want to plug this, that if you're out in New York City, anywhere near where this event's happening, uh, we have uh, Richard Gage is going to be speaking on May 24th at 4 p.m. at the Community Church of New York, the lower level. This is at 40 East Street, oh, sorry, excuse me, 40 East 35th Street, New York, New York. He's going to be giving the presentation, and this is going to be uh, off the heels of act, uh, actions going on uh, with the uh, 9-11 memorial that's just opening up. So go there, be there, be square. I may be there too, so if you um, if you happen to hear someone with my, my distinctive voice in the background and your, your ears come up and say hi, I'd be happy to meet you. Awesome stuff, awesome stuff, Andy. So I want to get right back into where we, where we kind of cut ourselves off going into break. The whole activism thing. Um, uh, you're, you're, what you do and how you operate and everything is very inspirational to others. Whether you realize that or not, it is. Um, even, uh, you know, if people, like a lot of times I do stuff just like you, I do a lot of stuff behind the scenes, and you're like me, you're not trying to find, uh, you're not trying to get gratitude or a pat in the back for it. So a lot of people just don't realize that you're the one doing it. 
but your actions, I know from an outsider because I see, I know a lot of the stuff that you know you've been responsible for. Your actions have inspired others as well. So that's important for people to see what you do and what others do because then hopefully they'll get inspired. It's like dominoes. That's how this is going to change. And you put it perfectly before. It's a revolution of the mind. It's and I I, I call it the evolution. Okay, of humanity. People are just growing up. That's why we, you know, 200 and some odd years ago, we needed to shoot each other because we weren't there yet, okay? Some of the founders were, but most of the general public wasn't. But now, fast forward 230 some odd years, and I think the general public's a little bit smarter and a little bit more in touch with their own humanity than they were back then. I mean, you got to remember, back then, people didn't even look at themselves like they were that important. You know, because look at history hundreds of years before that. People with no money, the, the middle class didn't exist. It was either the elites or the, you know, the have-nots. And the have-nots were always looking at themselves like they were lower class because that's what they were told their whole lives. You know, so humanity is just evolving over the course of time. And I, I like you, you put it best, this is a revolution. This has been going on for years. Okay, since the first person spoke out on 9-11 and said, BS. In fact, Bill Cooper warned about it. Months before, go look up on YouTube, Bill Cooper warns about 9-11. He was the first person on air that said they're going to attack us and they're going to blame Osama bin Laden. Don't believe it. And then they killed him. What, a month and a half, two months after 9-11? Not even two months, full two months after 9-11, they killed him? November 5th, 2001, Bill Cooper was killed. Right. And what's funny is a couple of weeks ago, I, I guess didn't work out, so I had to, to fill the hour. Well, what I filled the hour with was uh, Bill Cooper's epic... Uh, 10 or 11 hour broadcast on 9-11, obviously I didn't play the whole thing, but what I did play were clips from Bill Cooper saying right on the day of that there had to have been secondary devices uh, in the Twin Towers to help facilitate bringing them crashing to the ground like you saw on, on, on uh, that day, and he just was adamant about it, saying now they're going to be telling you that uh, that those airplane impacts caused the, the towers to collapse. That's absolutely impossible. And he was just, again, he just stuck to his guns and he was relying on his own common sense. What I love about uh, uh, which you were referencing about Bill Cooper uh, predicting the, the attack um, is kind of what he said. Now, I just want to say, obviously, I speak now for Andy Steele. AE 911 Truth doesn't get into complicity or anything like that, just scientific evidence that it was a controlled demolition. So that said, talking about Bill Cooper, he was talking about how, uh, I believe it was CNN, uh, did an interview with, uh, with bin Laden. And he's, he's saying essentially uh, the United States government with all its, its great intelligence system and all its military technology can't find this guy. But some jerk from CNN walks into a cave and gets an, an interview with bin Laden. How is this possible? And he was saying there's going to be an attack and, uh, and they're going to blame it on bin Laden and it's going to be used to, to attack our freedoms. And lo and behold, look what happened. Uh, months later so uh yeah it's great to go back and listen not even just to bill cooper but just folks uh throughout history i i, I eat breathe and, and uh sleep this stuff i mean literally i sleep this stuff i put it on when i go to bed uh a lot of times falling asleep to it but i was listening to a woman from the 70s talking about issues related to this she did some kind of broadcast uh on some kind of local radio and uh, it was just it, it's almost like a, not in a literal sense of course but it all, just mentally it feels almost like you're time traveling like you're standing in the same moment with this person from history comparing notes and that you're almost like communicating or something um, and you almost feel wish you could like talk to them and say no you were right about this and this happened and wow you know um, but that's another reason why it's so important to speak out because even if you don't feel like this is going to uh, you're going to do anything even if you don't feel like uh, you're going to expose 9-11 that were or rather what well, has been exposed but that you're not going to wake up enough people to make the government do anything about it now what you're doing is you're getting a historical record on the number of people that spoke out about it that's what my show is about we really uh primarily focus on the controlled demolitions of the towers but week after week i bring on guests who are architects engineers who are artists uh, playwrights who are doctors i mean numerous people getting down why they believe they're being lied to about what really brought the buildings down and going into the science. So you've created this historical narrative now that will exist in, in one form or another for the future. So when, if something else like this ever happens, God forbid, uh, people in the future will be able to draw 
from this event and and learn from it, and then they can look at their own 9/11 like event and uh, and question that. And what I like to feel like we're doing also by speaking, you know, we're talking about activism, is we're preventing the next 9/11 as best as we can, because with all these folks constantly talking about it, with with AE 9/11 Truth putting a rethink 9/11 billboard in Times Square last year, big as uh, big as uh, huge. I mean, I was there, I saw it. Uh, it was bigger than I imagined it would be. Um, and then with all these people calling into C-SPAN all the time, bringing up Building 7, you know the powers that be have to be afraid of trying this again. They know that the eyes of the world are on them, and that's a good thing. So you're also helping prevent the next thing from going on. That is why everything that you do is so important. I agree. And just to back up what we were talking about with Cooper, I have that audio clip here. It's about two minutes. I'm, I'm going to play it. And it's exactly, it's, it, you know, it, Andy said it pretty much verbatim. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself up. Andy, go ahead and mute up. I'll play it. This is Bill Cooper predicting 9-11. Let's listen to what he had to say. The audio is kind of eh, but it is what it is. I had to search for it fast on YouTube. One day I'll play the, the that full show. Anyway, here we go. And reporter found Osama bin Laden took a television camera crew with him went into Osama bin Laden's hideout, interviewed him and his top leadership, and he came out and told everybody, within three weeks, Osama bin Laden is going to attack the United States and Israel. Now, don't you think that's kind of strange, folks? You see, because the largest intelligence apparatus in the world with the biggest budget in the history of the world has been looking for Osama bin Laden for years and years and years and can't find him. Some doofus jerk-off reporter with a camera crew bosses right into his hideout and interviews him. And I'm telling you, be prepared for a major attack. But it won't be Osama bin Laden it will be those behind the New World Order. I wonder what Osama bin Laden's targets are supposed to be. And if they don't... There you go. And you can go... I mean, that's obviously from whatever movie somebody was watching and they were recording it with their crappy camera and their idiot friend wouldn't shut up in the background. But you can go look up on YouTube the full show. You can find the, the full episode where cooper predicted it longer clips where it's like you know 28 minutes in length so you get a little more context but you just heard him say you know the largest intelligence military oper you know apparatus in the world and intelligence apparatus in the world could not find this guy hiding in a cave somewhere in tora bora right okay hiding in his his cobra-esque command center in the middle of a mountain right okay and they couldn't find him but the CNN reporter could find him. Right. Right. Just saying. Just saying. That that alone should tell you something's wrong. Okay? Maybe people should go look up Marfan Syndrome and look up, what was it, I think December 20-something, 20 21st, 20th? Something interesting date for them to pick. But uh, I think it was like the 20th or the 21st it was reported on Fox News of that year, of 2001, that he had died. That Bin Laden was dead. Because he was, remember, he was on dialysis before 9-11. So I, my question, by the way, about the whole SEAL Team 6 raid is, was he, like, jumping Matrix style, or, like, bullet time over top of his dialysis machine to dodge the bullets from SEAL Team 6? And, and, just, where, and where was the dialysis machine? I didn't see them wheeling that out of there. Where, well, where, the, the where was that? The whole story about the whole SEAL, SEAL Team 6, and this goes into a topic I don't normally get into on my show, but I, I was awake. I didn't think I slept the entire week that they reported this uh, May 1st, 2011 kill of Bin Laden. And when, something that really struck me, and it, it was funny because it struck me and it struck the ABC News host that I was watching at 1 in the morning or whatever. Uh, this, they, they announced it, but that uh, they threw the body in the ocean. And you could see a look of, uh, of uh, di dismay, I guess, for, for lack of a better word, or, or skepticism. Across the uh, the anchor's face, and she said, "Well, the conspiracy theorists will have a have a field day with that one." But you could see that she herself wasn't even buying it. That they just taught suddenly now he's not a, he's not just a, a supposed 
Muslim boogeyman that we're all afraid of, but he's also a pirate. We're going to toss his body in the ocean. We're not going to show any photographs of the body. We're not going to uh, do uh, or, or show any video of it. Uh, the Obama administration has fought the AP uh, to, and, and kept the any supposed evidence that they have that this took place. I mean, uh, saying that we're not the kind of country that, that shows things like that, of course we are. Of course we are, and supposedly if he's the, the guy that orchestrated 9-11, playing devil's advocate, why wouldn't you want to show that to the American people and have independent verification so you could create some kind of closure? I'm not talking about parading the guy uh, on a crucifix through Times Square like we're ancient Rome or something. I'm talking about having independent verification, but they're not going to because it didn't happen. The story itself doesn't make sense. The video they released of the guy watching bin Laden on TV from the compound – uh, that they wanted to say was Bin Laden, watching himself, trying to put out that narrative, oh, what a loser he was in his last year. He's just living off of old glory. The guy had different ears and facial hair growth patterns. These things don't don't change you know, through your life. I mean, it was a completely different guy when you look at the side-by-side comparison. And uh, and then he was identified by a, by a Pakistani right on BBC as being his neighbor, Akbar Khan, however, however you pronounce it. But it was a completely different person. Another thing, too, another point I want to raise since I'm on this topic, they won't release the photos of bin Laden, you know, dead and, and bloody and horrible, but they released the photos of the other guys, who were killed in the compound, and they were bloody and horrible, and I got them. I mean, I got them on on, a thumb drive or something somewhere. They released those photos, but they won't release them of bin Laden. They were published in a newspaper, at least in uh, one in England. All right, so the whole story just stinks on its face. It's an absolute lie because they are lying to you about what happened. Andy, I know people that have recovered video files of some horrific stuff, okay? Like, I know a guy that... He per- he has this stuff stored away and a specially built hard drive hidden. Like a lot of these videos that came out of Iraq when we first went in, and they were the quote unquote terrorist videos that they, the government made sure the internet was taken down off the internet. The reason why that was blocked was because there was a lot of stuff they didn't want you to hear. Like some of these insurgent groups, and I'm doing air quotes when I say the word insurgent, we're talking about a new world order and a one world government. When you hear some of these videos, you're like, what? What are these guys talking? And they're, they're, these messages were intended to get to the American people, and they were telling us. Ba- ba- it's kind of, not all of them, but some of them were speaking very clear English, telling us, you know, they, they obviously these were you know, smarter gentlemen. Um, so I've seen, I, I've seen a lot of videos like that. I've actually played, uh, well, I have one piece, like I call it Just Who Were We Fighting in Iraq. It's about 10 minutes long. I'll send you the, the video clip for it. Uh, and so you can have it and check it out. Your, your jaw will drop when you hear what this guy is talking about. Every time I play it on air, the listeners are like, if the new people, like the newer ones, they're like, what? Oh, my God, I've never heard that. Yeah, it kind of makes you wonder what was really going on. Anyway, I had him scour this guy that does this. I asked him, I said, can you please scour the net and try to find me the real bin Laden photos, not these Photoshop crap fake disinfo ones that go around? And he was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. Dude, he still hasn't found anything. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, if it was out there, it would be out there, even if it was on the dark net. And the only thing that I've ever been able to see myself are these fake photos, which are obviously fakes. They're photoshops. They're not real. So where is the Bin Laden photos? There's even pictures of Saddam Hussein's kids when oh, after yeah. they were killed. So, I mean, where where are the photographs? Come on. I don't want to hear you they're going to make him a martyr. That's a lie. Well, it's not even a secret cryptic thing that they haven't released them. They admit they haven't released them. If you Google AP's lawsuit against Obama, I mean, AP, actually, to their credit in this case, well, an instance of the quote-unquote mainstream media trying to do the right thing, uh, sued to try to get the photos released, and the Obama administration has fought them. So it's not even one of those things that's like, oh, you know, I, I, I dare you to try to find the photos. They admit that they're not out there. Funny thing, though, about the photoshopped ones. All right, a couple of days after the supposed uh, bin Laden kill, a couple of senators, uh, the, uh, one of them was uh, Scott Brown, uh, came out and said, we saw the photos, he's dead, take our word for it. And then the, they got kind of questioned about it more, and it came out that, well, no, they saw the Photoshop ones that had been released as a joke back in 2005. And when I, the reason I'm highlighting that, and we were talking about C-SPAN and the reactions that some of these politicians get, is it's just further illustrates that these people are not on Mount Olympus 
here. Um, you know, they're, they're not uh, these all-knowing, uh, wise statesmen that we think they are. A lot of them are just as human as you and me, and many cases, when you listen to them, it, it doesn't sound like they know what they're talking about, especially when it comes to the 9-11 and what really happened that day. And the fact that these senators came out so boldly and so confident and said, we saw the, the photos of bin Laden and then had to later come out and say, okay, they were the photoshopped uh, fake ones. Uh, you know, it should make you feel good about yourself as uh, as somebody that really is uh, is just as capable as, as those folks uh, that you see on television to uh, to run this country. So uh, I know, I mean, the whole thing is it, it's an insult to people's intelligence. Uh, not just that, but with with nine eleven. I mean, we don't even have to get into things that are kind of kept hidden and, and locked up from us and, and pulled off the web. We can just go with. What's out there, out in the open? I mean, you know, those photos I referenced earlier about the other two guys that were killed at the Bin Laden compound, you can find that just by doing a Google search. I mean, I put them up on my various sites at one point when I was covering them. I, I can't remember the exact words to, to Google now, but you could find them. They're not hard. You can get them through me. You can get them probably from the original source still. It's right out there. It's right out there for you to see. 9-11, okay, Building 7. Anybody who has it two eyes or at least one eye and common sense will tell you that fire didn't cause the building to do that what you saw that day was a controlled demolition all right buildings do not a 47 story steel frame high rise cannot fall in six and a half seconds from random fires in the fashion that you saw i mean it can't fall in six and a half seconds to begin with all right so i mean just right there they're insulting your intelligence and when you bring it up and all you can uh, all they can do is call you a name in response to it you know you've got a problem here in america and you need to step up as as the new leader at least intellectually uh you know for yourself uh and then kind of uh, uh, uh gather people together and and uh you know make this revolution happen that we've been talking about tonight I agree. Uh, again, well said. Um, that's why I brought you on because I knew you were so passionate, and I knew you were so well spoken about it. Um, if if people just start to look at this for five minutes, they'll realize that their intelligence is being insulted. Uh, I mean, I, I did. Look, when when it first happened, I was so closely uh, and emotionally attached to it uh, that I did not. I didn't look at some of the evidence that was right in front of my face. In, in fact, um, the the French guy, I can't remember his name right now, but I've actually published a lot of his articles. Um, he wrote uh, a book, I think it was called The Terrible Lie, if I remember correctly, and it came out a couple months afterwards. And it pointed out how there was a lot of inconsistencies uh, with the official version. And because he was French and I was American and I was caught up in that idiocy, or idiocy, I should say, and that patriotic fervor, I was like, oh, F him, that dumbass Frenchman. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I'll kick him's ass. Blah, blah, blah. Our government wouldn't do that. And I believed that they had lied to us already. I already thought that they had shot Flight 93 down and they just didn't tell anybody. Okay, I had thought that from the first day simply because where I lived in New Jersey, they were talking on the local radio reports. My mom had like three different radios tuned in to three different frequencies. We had I was a firefighter, so we had scanners and stuff, and there was reports that the Na Air National Guard was chasing another jetliner that was inbound, which was Flight 93, supposedly, whatever, right, according to the official story. And they then it came in that the plane had crashed, and not not even 10 minutes later man two f-16s came roaring over my house from that direction you know from pennsylvania going towards new york so we surmised that those were the two jets and i mean they flew so low that you could see the weapons pods and one of the planes was missing a missile at least one that you could tell and i looked at my mother and she saw she said did you just see that and i said yes and i said to her i grew up my father was a, an airedale in the navy so i grew up going to museums and learning about jets and planes and what they sounded like. I could tell there were two S-16s before they even flew over the house. In fact, we walked outside and looked up, and I said, watch. And they came, they were so frigging low, you could see them. I mean, you could see the weapons pods on the bottom. Again, that's how low they were. So if my mother was still alive, she would be able to test to this. So the whole original story I never bought with Flight 93. I, I figured they made up the story of the passengers overtaking 
uh, the plane as a way to cover up the fact that they probably, and even if the passengers, I, I kind of figured maybe it was a little mix of both, that the passengers were overtaking the plane and they were, you know, for whatever reason, they shot the plane down anyway. I always thought that they shot Flight 93 down, but I figured they were lying about it because the general public would freak out, and I was like, that's kind of effed up, but I, I was still, because I was a first responder too, I was very emotionally attached to what I had done and what I had how I had helped out and what I had seen and experienced, which was not even a quarter of what most people had seen or experienced, but still. Uh, and I was dealing with, you know, other things. So I wasn't even paying attention to that. You know, I was dealing with survivor's guilt. You know, a lot of people were. Nobody was paying attention to those, you know, at least even some people were, but most of the people in that general area weren't. Years later, when I started researching it and I started looking into it, I was like, What? Like as soon as I started researching it with a clear mind, mind you, I had to go back and I had to cut my emotion off about it. Once I was it because I hadn't, it got to the point where I couldn't even watch the videos of the buildings coming down anymore because it just it stirred too much emotion, um, too much. It was just too for somebody that was anybody that was close to it or connected to it in any way could understand what I'm talking about. Okay, it was just too much for me to handle. A couple years later, when I was able to go back and I started looking at it again, I was like, hey, wait a minute, because I. I, I was a firefighter for six and a half years, so I know what doesn't make sense. You know, you know that you know that game one of these things is not like the other, you know? Hmm. I started looking at video footage and I was like, wait a minute. That looks like a squib. And and I was like, Whoa, whoa, this is before I had seen the videos and I was like, No, no, no. You know, and I thought I was insane and I still thought that the quote unquote, even though I believed in conspiracies, I thought the nine eleven conspiracies were just overboard. And the more and more I looked into it, the more and more I realized I was the one that was wrong and that these people that were bringing this information to light were not wrong and that I had to check myself. And as soon as I was able to get over my own ego and put that in check, I was able to look at the information with a fresh set of eyes and a fresh mind. And that's when I went, whoa. And then I just started to consume as much as I possibly could. I just started to, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? As soon as you wake up to this, you're just like, you start to read as much as you can. You start, even if you don't know about, like, I already knew about fire engineering and stuff from being a firefighter. So I had a bit of an up on some people. So I went to, you know, what maybe would have been step two for some people. I started off there. And from where, where I started off, it was just like, wait a minute, this doesn't make a damn load of sense at all. And the more I start, and then I started to, like, I didn't even realize that fire engineering, the, the, the people over at Fire Engineering Magazine called the, uh, the whole cleanup a half-baked farce. Uh, I, I didn't know, uh, it, you know, and the subsequent investigation into it, they called it a half-baked farce. I didn't know that. And then I found that out years later, and you have to understand, as a firefighter, I read Fire Engineering Magazine. I respected these guys, and here are these guys, fellow firefighters that I respect, putting out this publication, and they're saying, yeah, this doesn't pass the sniff test. And I was like, wait a minute, there's even firefighters that are saying this? So now, I, you know what I mean? And over the course of time, I just started to realize that something wasn't right. And it, I mean, it didn't take that long. It, it was in, within a few weeks of me consuming information, I was up to par. Uh, on what was going on and then I just you know I set sail from there and if 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 that's you know that's just one story and I know everybody kind of has the same story it's amazing I'm going to cut us off though because the break is sneaking up on us ladies and gentlemen hour one just flew right by as it always does Andy is an awesome guest just great check his websites out help him spread the word join do what he does call C-SPAN and don't go anywhere because we have another hour Three short minutes. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with hour number two here on tonight's live edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. I am your host, Popeye from FederalJack.com. Tonight, I'm hanging out with my good friend, Andrew Steele. Ladies and gentlemen, I urge you to go check his work out. Andy, shameless plugs before we get back into it. Once again, plug all of your stuff and... Um, if you want to give out your email or anything, whatever, any contact info, whatever, throw it all out there. Sure, you can contact me at A Steel. My last name has an extra E at the end, so it's A S T E E L E at A E nine eleven Truth dot org. If you want to talk nine eleven Truth stuff, um, also uh, the website's nine one one freefall dot com. You can keep up with the show. I also forgot to plug this earlier, so I want to get this in. Uh, we got uh, some great volunteers working on the High Rise Safety Initiative. Uh, if you want to find out more about that you can go to high rise safety nyc.org uh it's a ballot initiative attempting to get a get the city to and i want to make sure i get it exactly correct here uh and, and the way that they they phrase it um 
but uh, there's a state law called municipal home rule um, allows for voters anywhere in New York State to amend their city's charter through a bail initiative process. It's basically getting the city to to investigate when high rises fail. All right, whenever they collapse, starting on September 11th, 2001. Now it would not get into towers one and two, but it would force the city to investigate building seven. So you can learn more about that. A lot of people working hard at that, and it's very—it's a very calm approach to the issue because it's not even talking about controlled demolition or uh, uh, inside job, of course, or anything like that. It's just saying that we need to have a better understanding of why this building failed, and that's just a common sense approach. And they actually have a commercial, a uh, YouTube commercial of an architect. Uh, saying why he b- supports the high rise safety initiative and why you should too, and that's really the way you're going to wake people up because a lot of people, uh, just your general run of the mill folks out there, uh, are they're not awake to the bigger picture on these things. They don't even if they may have heard something about it, they don't care. And it's it's getting them to look at something like Building 7 falling and saying, that's not right, that doesn't make sense to me, to get them to take that first step. I mean, you were talking about your awakening story. Um, I, I, when I first heard people talking about this, I wasn't even really particularly outraged. My attitude was just kind of a, a more joking, like, wow, this stuff's starting pretty quick, <laughs> you know, right a few days uh, after the event. And... Um, and then when it, but it took me, it took someone pointing my attention to Building Seven, and pointing out the fact that fire couldn't do this to a building to really make me say, okay, we got a problem here, and trying to debunk it and unable to, and I mean, look at me now. This is this is what I do uh, in my in my spare time. So uh, you never know who you're going to wake up, but you can do it through these very uh, calm and just uh, very oh meaningful campaigns like this one that really again doesn't talk about controlled demolition doesn't talk about inside job or anything like that just says hey we need to understand why this building fell down and i really think anybody regardless of what side uh of the fence they're on has no choice but to support something like that so high rise safety nyc.org check that out i like that approach because then you're getting right to the root of the issue and that also brings up another point that i've brought up since 9 11 um even before I was, uh, you know, awake to the what was going on, I, I used to say, "Well, man, if those buildings fell down, they're going to have to change building code." Because again, as a firefighter, I understood building code. Um, you know, my brother was a building inspector, so I understood. Okay, and the first thing I said was, "I guess they're going to have to change all high-rise codes and everything." But yet, I haven't seen building codes get changed because of jet fuel fires. <laughs> so, uh, could could somebody explain that after two buildings? That for the first time in history, vapor all well, three, but the the, sec, the the third one wasn't hit by a jet, so that doesn't count in this scenario. Uh, how two buildings that were hit by, you know, planes, but small, comparatively small to the rest of the building, fires in the building, uh, could crumble into their own uh, respective areas. I won't say footprints because there was a little bit outside of the footprint, but we'll say in their own respective areas, uh, and pretty much turn into dust, not not fall. But pulverized. In fact, we realized it that day. I remember we were at Giant Stadium, and I remember sitting there, and we were we were all sitting there. <sighs> there was a bunch of they had called for active duty, uh, retired volunteer, whoever firefighters to show up, and uh, the firehouse, the the company that I was on at the time, they weren't sending a truck down. The other house was in town, uh, so they were covering both sides of town. So I went on my own. I had my own gear, and I went and picked up another friend of mine. And him and I went down to Giant Stadium in my pickup truck by ourselves, and we we hooked up with the ambulance crews that were there from out of state, and we were gonna we had hooked up with the state police. They they sent us to the ambulance crews, and then we were gonna run with the ambulance crews when they started bringing over the victims. And we were sitting there for about two and a half hours, and we're all talking, just waiting, and we're listening to the radio traffic, and they're telling us that they're they're barely finding anybody, and that they're they're finding they were literally finding bunker gear with nobody in it. Hmm. And, and like they or you know pieces of people, and we started to realize like we all started to as we're listening to some of this radio chatter and stuff, and we were hearing you know this it, it just you could s- smell the death, and you're you know you're hearing the state police traffic and everything because we kept we stayed by the radio tent as much as possible. I heard when they arrested the guys by the GW uh, the George Washington Bridge with the van full of explosives. 
they, they, they described them as Middle Eastern men, and then later it turned out to be they were Israeli guys, and they were connected to Mossad. Oh, that's interesting in and of itself. But we were sitting there, and we were all talking, and while we were chatting, uh, we realized that we were sitting there like we kept you know going over the the images of the buildings coming down in our heads, and we realized that the you know the pile of stuff that was there compared to what was you know the buildings we were like wow a lot of that stuff must have vaporized but we didn't even think about that we just you know in my head i remember saying to myself well the the people inside the buildings must have been vaporized from all of that pressure now i was kind of correct i just didn't realize where the overpressurization came from you know what i mean i didn't i didn't put two and two together that day because i think now that I look back on it, as soon as I thought about that same thought, and you know, I started looking into the explosives and stuff in the buildings, I was like, oh, it makes co- total sense. But that day, I was so emotionally affected because I was there. I mean, dude, where we were staged at Giant Stadium and where I lived in New Jersey, we were only 20, 22 miles from New York. I could see the mushroom cloud, and you could smell it. You could smell death. Anybody that lived in that vicinity knows what I'm talking about. There's a lot of you out there that are tuned in right now. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You could smell the death in the air. It was repugnant. So it was. It hit us at a different level. And as someone who's trained to run into the building where everybody's you know running out of to save people, we were helpless that day. We couldn't do anything. Because what we could have done that day, our job that day, was to bring the injured to the local hospitals with the out-of-state ambulance crews. We couldn't fulfill our mission. I could not succeed in the mission that I was given because there was nobody to save. And that was a hard pill to swallow. And the emotional reaction to that clouded any other logic that I had, which is that's normally what happens. And I mean, a lot that goes into, you know, the the politics of why they did and everything else. You know, all that, you know, fear is, you know, a great method of control and so is. uh, uh, you know, trauma-based mind control, but that reaction that I had blocked me from looking at it on a logical level. As soon as I was able to get past that a couple of years later and deal with my survivor's guilt and everything else and deal with the how helpless I felt not being able to save people, because I've literally saved people's lives as a firefighter before, you know, even, you know, since then, but, and, you know, before, but I've, I've, that's, I've literally pulled people out of, you know, cars and I've pulled people out, you know, helped people out of buildings and put fires out and stuff that's what i've done okay i'm not a hero there's a lot of people that do it but the point is when you're trained in that position and that's what you do and that's who you are you know and you can't do that and you watch all these people helplessly you know you realize that these people died and there's nothing you can do including your fellow emergency responders that is really traumatic and it blinded me from looking at it once i was able to get like i said once i got past that man it was like, whoa, two and two started to equal four, and I started to realize what was going on. And, and I remembered, again, I remembered, like I said that day, that, wow, those people must have been vaporized. I just didn't think one step further, which normally if I wasn't in an emotional state, I would have. But I didn't think one step further because, I mean, I was trained in arson investigation. I spent a year and a half getting trained in arson investigation and explosion investigations. And here, you know, it was you know, a huge explosion and I I couldn't use any of that training because the emotional reaction to it was so overwhelmingly powerful that it hit me like a friggin' freight train. Years later though, a couple years later, and it wasn't too long later, it was about the end of two thousand and three, beginning of two thousand and four when I started to read books uh that were being put out uh you know from guys on the ground in the Iraq war and my I started to change my whole position uh about you know backing the war and everything and I was like wait a minute and then something stumbled across my my desk about the 911 stuff again and it brought me back to oh this these people are crazy and then again I started looking into it and it was like whoa Whoa, wait a minute. And then again, I, in fact, I have, I don't even know if they still, they probably have a newer version of it, but um, I have an old, the NFPA. Um, they, they're, and I don't, maybe they finally got some sort of, you know, official backing. They were always an official organization, but it, they would put out guidelines, but it wasn't really guidelines. It was like voluntary guidelines that fire departments would willingly adhere to, but it wasn't a governmental agency, uh, but it's very respected uh, in the, the firefighting industry. Anyway, when I went to um, the fire academy for uh, and uh, to, down to, uh, I took uh, college classes uh, at, a, at a state college in Jersey um, for arson investigation, They you one of the th- books I have is this NFPA guide on arson investigation and explosions. So I immediately went to my guide 
And I say this because there's a lot of smart firefighters and investigators out there that know exactly what I'm talking about. And I want you guys to do the same thing. Go back and look through your NFPA fire and explosion investigation guide, right? Start whipping that thing out and start reading through it, okay? And then go back and look at the official story. And you're going to go, no way, period. It's that simple. Yeah, and I mean, telling the truth there and... It's funny, just basic common sense things that people just assume happened. You know, again, I, I don't even have the kind of background you do as a firefighter. I was writing comic books when 9-11 happened, and all of a sudden now, the, because the buildup to the Iraq war happened uh, after 9-11, pretty shortly after within the next couple of years, now I have all this serious stuff being introduced into my circle of friends here, and we're sitting here debating geopolitics when before we were talking about just complete utter nonsense and enjoying doing it um and, and you talked about helplessness i'm going to get to that in just a moment but you, you people assume things like that they tested for explosives but um but no they didn't and they use the circular reasoning that we, well we don't need to because we don't expect to find any so we don't need to you know it's just this silly nonsense when you ask them for the data for their uh, that they use to create their models for world trade center 7 when i say they i'm talking about national institute of standards and technology the agency tasked with investigating why this building uh was the, allegedly the biggest engineering failure in history um they they won't give you that data and they the reason they won't give it to you is because they cite this 2002 law that they passed saying that they can withhold it if, if uh, they deem that giving it to the public would jeopardize public safety. Well, how is it going to jeopardize public safety for a building that doesn't exist anymore? I mean, it's just laughable. And we, you were talking about that feeling of helplessness. I think a lot of people felt helpless after that day. The kind of helplessness that I felt at first until I kind of overcame it and realized that it's just an illusion um, was the helplessness of realizing that uh, conspiracy theorists have a, not just have a point, have a very big point, um, and nobody's really addressed their concerns, and then watching the way that the media responds to them. And when they brought on Stephen Jones, and I just happened to catch it right like that day uh, that he was came on Tucker Carlson's show. I don't know if anyone's seen the YouTube video of this. Type it in uh, Stephen Jones Tucker Carlson. I watched this live as it happened. I thought, okay, good. They're going to address this Building Seven thing and give it some time. And apparently, they had asked him before the interview uh, if he wanted any videos to be shown. He said, "Well, just the, the Building Seven video, the, the video of that collapsing." And during the interview, he kept asking them to show that, and they wouldn't. They just kept on trying to rush him through it. They weren't really like giving him his fair shot to get his argument out. It was very telling, and that's when I really knew we have a problem here. You know, when they're trying to tell me that I see things, and they're just all they they can do is attack the people that are talking about this, uh, calling them names. Suddenly, that's a very lonely feeling as somebody who is is awake and not afraid to face harsh realities, scary realities. And so what do you do with that? Well, suddenly now you are in a position of responsibility because the fact that you're awake to this and aware of this means you need to do something about it or admit that you're just helpless. And some people do take that second path. Right, but it's very empowering to uh, to actually speak out, as we talked about so much on the show. I won't uh, rehash it because when you realize the kind of power that you have to affect history and and uh, shake the establishment of, of Washington D.C. and really the world by just you know by simple things like we talked about calling C-SPAN whatever, um, you know that that makes you feel better about the world too because you realize that uh, you can change things um it thing that the the powers that be aren't as mighty as you think they are so that that's a i mean that's a good thing too but i can understand the helplessness that people feel because things feel like they're so big and so beyond our reach it's a lie that it that that it is but um but i i understand that feeling because it's like what can i do and people don't want their responsibility because you know you don't take yourself all that seriously most people don't uh even if you're some big time uh, mover and shaker or some big time celebrity or some celebrity politician or whatever i guarantee you uh, anybody who's effective doesn't really think that they themselves are all that big of a deal now the people who think that they themselves are a real big deal usually are the problems too 
uh, they're narcissistic, and uh, maybe we maybe we have uh, too many of them in Washington D.C. right now. But overall, the people listening right now, you, you, uh, many people think, well, I can't really do much because, you know, who am I? What do I know? What do I know how to do? All right, but that is an illusion. And uh, yeah, a great example of this and something I like to just throw up about how you, how you perceive yourself and how the rest of the world perceives you are not uh, the same. Um, I, I've heard this is a fact that the way you hear your own voice within your own head is not the same way that the rest of the world hears you, that there's something about the way your bones are structured in your skull that affects the way you hear your own voice. And everyone's had that, had that uh, experience where you listen to yourself on a tape. I'll probably listen to this interview later and, be, and think, oh, wow, I, I sound like that. You know, I, I know that because I do a show every week. But um, you, know, you say, oh, I can't believe I sound like that. That's not the way I sound to myself. So the way the rest of the world hears you is not the same way that you hear yourself, and and that branches out because uh, a lot of times people do interviews, people uh, call into talk shows and think they did a bad job, and then later on everyone's like, oh, you did a great job, it was great. So uh, people need to get past their own personal limitations and get past all these doubts that they have because they're manufactured within you I, I almost think that our system is designed to make you insecure and think that you're lesser than uh, the so-called experts that they put on TV or the uh, the, the big uh, machine that is supposed to be protecting you and, and telling you what to do they, they create insecurity so people stay within their own boxes um, because uh, I'm going to tell you I mean just doing a little bit has a major impact on, on what's going on. I've said that so many times tonight. Um, but uh, you know, you can do you can move mountains when you want to. It's just a question of attitude. So that's my uh, that's my speech. I completely concur. Uh, <clears throat> you know, people just assume that they're powerless. They don't realize that every little pinprick uh, is effective. It's just like I like the analogy you used earlier about boxing. You know, you're wearing your opponent down. Uh, you know, it's like dancing around, letting your opponent take wild swings at you, and just just dodge. All you gotta do is step back and dodge. Learn how to dance, and then when your opponent gets tired out, bam! What did Muhammad Ali used to say? Float like a butterfly, sting like sting a bee. Sting like a bee. Right. Yeah, and and this is another thing too is that <clears throat> is is this illusion that and when we talk about the establishment, it seems like kind of a cliche word. I use it because it's just an easy way to sum up the media, the political system, the people in those uh, systems, um, anybody that is kind of part of the status quo. So pardon me for using a cliche, but uh, it seems that the establishment wants to put in your minds <clears throat> that you need them. And I'm telling you, you don't. And it's a very simple message. The people listening to this show right now, I guarantee most of them probably don't have the television on, have no idea what's even on television right now. Because people have turned it off. Because they don't want to hear that. They want to hear this. They want to hear us on this program, and they want to hear your next program with whoever guest you're going to have on next week. They want to hear this stuff. And they don't care that we uh, don't have PhDs uh, next to our names. They don't care that we don't have big glitzy advertisements uh, and billboards with our faces on them. They just want to hear the truth. They want to hear people who are like-minded, and that's really the secret to to attracting people and uh, and getting them to listen to you is just listen to their concerns and be open and honest and uh, truthful. And you don't have to be uh, you know you don't have to to speak like Obama does. I mean, look at Ron Paul during the last election. I mean, Ron Paul wasn't uh, the best speaker. I'm not saying he was a bad speaker, but he wasn't uh, some as silver tongued as Obama reading off of his teleprompter. But he told the truth, and people loved him for it. Okay, so that's really the secret. And then you get better at, at whatever you do. If you want to be a writer, you get better as you, as you do it, just perfecting your craft. But getting back to what I was starting off talking about. The, the establishment makes you uh, or puts in your mind this idea that you actually need them. And, and the fact is that you don't. And that's their biggest concern. All these narcissists that you see on the television and the political establishment, their biggest fear is not that you're going to fight back against them, is that you're going to make them irrelevant. And another form of protest is just simply unplugging from them as much as you possibly can. All right, just uh, turning them off 
Yeah, I'm just saying, I really don't. Um, I'm I'm not really part of the America that you're a part of. The real America is this audience, the people out there telling the truth, fighting for freedom, and um, and who have broken away. And it, it it doesn't have to be a geographical break away from some kind of mother country or, or setting up a new government. It's just an intellectual breaking away. It's like the revolution we talked about earlier. And so another empowering thing to do is just say, hey. You know, I don't want to be part of that group anymore. I don't want to sit at the cool kids' table. I'm going to create my own cool kids' table. I'll tell you a quick story. When I was in college, before 9-11 happened, when I was just concerned with drawing comics and, and uh, that was going to be my life, I went uh, the first week, my freshman year, to the school newspaper, the college newspaper, and offered my services as a cartoonist. And they flat out rejected me. didn't really give me a, any real reason for it. They just didn't want a cartoonist or I don't even remember what the reason was. So instead of just sitting around and, and whining about it, what I did is I just created my own comic zine. It was a one-page thing. Uh, very kind of chintzy put together. Uh, I just created some panels, drew the comics, created some characters. The people loved them. Uh, I, I, just, I went down to the student center, printed them out, like maybe 200 copies with the money I, I made from my job that I had at the time and just kind of laid them out all over the place, all over the campus. And people would pick them up and be like, what's this? What's this? And then the dining or some kind of restaurant or something wanted to pay me some with free food for some advertising in it. And it became like this phenomenon. Some people didn't like it because it covered some controversial uh, humor in it, but, uh, but most people did. And what ended up happening is that the next year, my sophomore year, the college – uh, the new editor of the college paper came to me and wanted me to do the cartoons for her uh, for her editorials. Come up with some cartoon for that, and then they gave me a strip that lasted a little while. It ended up getting getting pulled over other uh, issues, but um, but basically, when you create your own castle, other people come to it. You bring the world to you. You throw a lasso around the planet and pull it towards you, and that's really what that's the key to success. Don't be trying to join other establishments if those establishments are toxic if they're treating you like you're scum create your own draw from their own pool and and overcome them and you can have a lot of success doing that if you just take that attitude and make these toxic entities that are ruling us right now completely irrelevant because they are irrelevant they're irrelevant people and that, that's what they're most afraid of as I said before is not uh, not being important anymore I say it all the time. I say the exact same thing. That's how we beat them is just by making them irrelevant because once they're irrelevant, they're, that's it. And that's why they use these police state tactics. They have their bullies dressed up in big black scary costumes and they tell them, yeah, you can beat and shoot people because they need to stay relevant. They need that to feel empowered. They need that to actually literally be in power. And the, the true secret is that you're not alone. And just like I, I use the reference all the time, the best visual I tell people to use is the end of the first Matrix when Neo stands back up. And the first thing he says before he even puts his hand up, he looks at them and he says, no. And they turn around and they open fire and he puts his hand out. Because he, now he's already empowered himself because he already said, no, I'm not going to comply anymore. I'm not going to play. You're irrelevant. You're not important. And to prove that, he put his hand up, and what happened? The bullet stopped because he could see everything. He realized they were nothing more than a program and that he was actually the one with the true power and not them. And that's, that was the whole you know, allegory of the first movie, what, what the problem was and the fact that you have the true power to do something about it and stop it. Now, the second two didn't suck, by the way. Uh, there, there's, there's a lot more deeper meaning to it. I've gone over that on other broadcasts. I, I won't get into it now because we've got a break sneaking up on us. Um, Andy, when we get back, I want to pick your brain about one other thing, uh, the state of the 9-11 Truth movement as it is right now and what we can do to light a fire back underneath it. So everybody stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. When we get back more with my friend Andrew Steele. Check him out. One hell of an activist. Like I said, he's a general in this battle, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. You see why I... Had Andy on. I mean, I got to get him on more often. But you see, like, I, I why I like having him on because he's inspirational. Uh, he's he's on point. He knows what the solution is. He knows that if we do not actually actively get involved and change uh, the way people think, not only about 
9-11, but about themselves in general and how they're not powerless. I mean, that's, that's very powerful. I'm glad, I'm glad you, you know, expanded on that thought and went deep because it's important for people to hear that stuff, Andy. People need to hear the truth. They don't hear that kind of stuff from the mainstream. They don't really even hear that a lot in the alternative media. A lot of times people get too bogged down in the minutia, which it's important to talk about this stuff. But um, this stuff can get so daunting at times or that it could look like it's such a daunting task, you know, a, a mountain that is insurmountable. We're not going to be able to climb it. You know, it's K2. We're all going to die before we reach the summit. And yet we have a helicopter behind us. We just don't realize it uh, quite that often. And people, I think when people hear, not only me, because I talk about this all the time on the show, but I think when people hear other activists and other hosts, you know, other humans uh, talk about the same stuff, and they hear, you know, what you said, it's empowering. Not because, again, coming from me, they can be like, okay, Popeye's always saying that. He's always telling us that we're strong and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, maybe maybe it kind of gets in their head, like almost hearing like their mother or their father, you know, drone on or a teacher. And it, I think it, it kind of recharges it when they hear somebody else come in. Uh, and it's not an echo chamber, uh, but you come in and you say the same thing but with your own twist on it. You know what I mean? And it, it hits home. It really does. People need to hear that, Andy. They really do. Uh, especially the 9-11 Truth Movement as a whole, I think, because uh, I, I, I see it's kind of stalled out in the past couple of years. I kind of blame um, perhaps Cass Sunstein and the, 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 the government trolls a little bit because they did outline a plan like David Ray Griffin laid out in Cognitive Infiltration, great book people need to read. Uh, they did have this idea uh, and you know if if this stuff is public and these papers get out there in the public, you can bet your bippy there's probably a plan on paper somewhere where they actually wanted to activate this. And you know they talked about infiltrating groups and bringing it down by demoralizing groups and having a lot of infighting and that's what I actually see going on. And I think everybody needs to get back on point because 9-11 is not an old thing. Oh, well, it's so long ago. No, it's not. It's not that long ago. Are you kidding me? Kennedy's assassination was 50 years ago, and I still harp about it. And so does a lot of other people. 9-11 wasn't even 15 years ago, ladies and gentlemen. Use your brains for a second. Do the math. Think about how, how not far ago in history it is. Well, just ask your audience, you know, when was the last time you heard 9-11 invoked to uh, self-stealing their latest uh, civil liberty? I mean, it, it's still affecting us to this day, regardless, even if it was 30 years ago, if you still had 9-11 being invoked to pass some new law uh, to justify uh, the, the evisceration of our freedoms, the destruction of our Constitution, then it's still relevant, and we're still in the post-9-11 world. Now, you were talking about infighting and uh, you know the state of the 9/11 Truth movement. Um, it, yeah, it does happen. There's people who have different views of certain things, and there's really no reason that people should be looking for uh, uh, excuses to separate themselves from each other within this movement. And I see this within alternative news. If somebody doesn't agree with you 100% on what the big picture is, uh, people get in fights over this. You know, on my show, look, I lean I'm, I'm toward. I'm a Ron, Ron Paul libertarian leaning uh, person, but I bring on people from the left, and sometimes they bring up things about climate change being this. Uh, epic, horrible, uh, uh, scary situation that we need to face. I don't personally believe that, but I don't get into it with them. I don't. Uh, I don't start a fight over that because I stay focused on the goal. All right. Same. Uh, same respect. If if somebody is a you know if you're some kind of atheist and somebody in your 9/11 truth circle uh, brings up Jesus or, or whatever, there's really no reason to get in a fight with them over that. Somebody doesn't have to agree with you 100% on every single issue for you to find common ground. And 9/11 truth, the science of 9/11 truth, with the buildings in New York and what really happened to them, is the the, the greatest common ground that we can. Uh, that, that we do have currently. I mean, this is a banner that everyone needs to unite under because regardless of who you are, what you believe, what your race is, what your gender is, where you're from uh, in this world, uh, physics doesn't change. You know, we, we talk about Air Force and all the stuff standing down on 9-11. Well, physics didn't stand down. It can't stand down, okay? Uh, physics were in, in play on 9-11, and they, they tell the story. All right. So this is something that can unite everybody, and this is the reason that you need to take this approach, again, when you're talking to politicians on C-SPAN, because it's not something they can wiggle out of. They can't just say it's your opinion or that this guy really meant that. 
All right, now they can try to argue uh, with you on the physics, but they're losing that argument. So this is really where everyone needs to be. And then, regardless of whatever you want to believe the big picture is, and who's causing nine, who caused nine eleven, who's destroying the world right now, the only way you're going to get to bringing those entities down is by waking the public up to the reality of what happened on 9-11 with the science, all right, getting them to look and to look at the, the issue in a new light. And even if you can't convince somebody that know, it was an inside job, it was a controlled demolition, you can get them to say that. If you can get them to look at Building 7 and say that it's weird and it deserves a new investigation, that's really all you need from them. That's really, you got them exactly where you want them, to support a new investigation. It's weird. It needs to be looked at again. All right, and that's the most common sense argument anybody can take, even if you don't want to get passionately involved with this issue like the like we are and, and like the listeners are. Um, and so, you know, people bickering with each other over this and that or this side issue and politics and everything. This is not a political issue. And you know, what drives me nuts is when I start talking about nine eleven and. Somebody says, I don't want to hear about politics. This isn't politics. This is a mass murder investigation. All right? This is not a political issue. All right? So, again, your humanity and your, your desire to see justice for those victims once you wake up to this should unite us all. And KRS-One had a great speech. He's probably articulated it better than, than I am right now. It's from uh, the, the, an event that We Are Change did. Uh, near Ground Zero, probably 2008, I think it was. He's KRS One, the the rapper, spoke, and he had a great speech about how we need to trust each other and we need to have each other's backs. Um, so I mean, I, everyone should look that up. But I mean, that's that's the truth. We can't be trying to. I mean, we we have enough entities working against us through infiltration and cast Sunstein, as you you mentioned, that we don't need to be looking for excuses uh, ourselves uh, to create more rifts. All right, we have to unite, and again, AE 911 Truth, not just because I volunteer for the organization. The reason I volunteer for the organization is because I really believe these are the people that have the best chance at, at exposing this. Because, again, uh, they can try to argue with the science, the other side, but they fail miserably. And you can see this when, when, uh, when in debates and, uh, and when the politicians are questioned about it. So uh, all these other issues should be on the back burner that people are, are concerned about. I'm not saying they're not important or they're not relevant, but at the core of them is 9-11 and the post-9-11 world that we're all living in. So that's... Uh, well, that, and I think people need to learn logical fallacies and they learn they need to learn rational uh, argumentation. Uh, and they need to because, like, if I'm debating 9-11 with you and say you are... You're, okay, you're architects and engineers. I'm one of the... Judy Wood crowd, okay, part of that cult, and and I say that because those people, there's no debating them, but and that's not an ad hominem. It's just it is the way it is. I've tried debating them with rational argumentation, it doesn't work. But say you say something, and I'll come at you and I attack you, right? And I say, well, you're just a, a jerk, or you're an idiot, or you're you're covering up, you're a government shill, you're just trying to hide the truth. No, if if there's two differing opinions, let's try to have a valid debate without emotion and just logic because that's the only way the people that are uninitiated to 9-11 at all are going to pay any attention to us because right now if they look and I don't I, I shouldn't say us because I don't consider myself part of one a part of any singular group I'm just me and I talk about everything uh, but if you know they're they're going to look at anybody that speaks about 9-11 I, I, I should say us though because we're all in this together so they're going to look at everybody that talks about this uh, you know, an outsider who want, maybe is looking into this because they're interested, but they're not quite sure. They're kind of on the fence still. They're going to get alienated if they come in here and they see a lot of infighting and yelling and screaming, which they do. Now, that doesn't mean people can, can't have differing opinions and can't debate. Of course they can. But people need to learn how to do so in a manner that is not yelling and screaming at each other. And the problem is this country has been dumbed down to the point where any conversation you have where it's differing opinions about anything – it could be about a bowl of pretzels and whether or not to have cheese dip with it or not, and people are going to have a friggin' fist fight over it and a screaming match because they can't control their emotions because they've been so dumbed down. There is no more rational, logical thought. You know what I mean? Like, logic does not kick in. 
Well, I think that was done on purpose. I, you of know, I talked about this on my show where the other side. Uh, and actually, let me back up. I think the general public doesn't want to enter into this issue because there's so much negativity attached to it. And if you think about it, the other side, you know, the Fox News, the Bill O'Reilly's, the Sean Hannity's folks, uh, the way that they would try to stifle debate would be by calling names, people, calling people names, you know, saying you're a conspiracy freak, you're a kook. And it could be somebody making a very rational argument or just asking questions, not even saying it's an insight job or anything like that, just asking the very rational questions that woke me up. And, and someone like Bill O'Reilly would jump down their throat and say, you know, you're a, you hate America, you're a kook. And so what this does for the average person who at that time most activists and people speaking out were not used to this, they're kind of getting blindsided by it, you immediately get into a defensive posture because you got this blowhard calling you, a, calling you names here when you're being very rational. And then they get excited. So the, the, the quote-unquote mainstream media, not so mainstream anymore, uh, were the ones that took it up to that 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 higher level of, of insanity by turning it into a shouting match. And the people on the outside see this, and they may even see that Bill O'Reilly is, is being a jerk, but, uh, but even if they see that and recognize that, Bill O'Reilly has still succeeded because they've coded the whole debate with so much negativity that nobody wants to get in on it. Nobody wants to like just put their, their hat in this ring. Why not just stay out of it because it's, it's a negative process. And I always, you know, I'm, I, I'm trying to come along to this uh, way of thinking too, and I'm, I'm, I'm succeeding more and more as I get older, is that even though 9-11 with uh, buildings in New York were brought down in a controlled demolition and your media and your government are lying to you and we're slowly becoming an a increasing police state um, here in America, um, doesn't mean you can't enjoy your life too, all right? Because if you, they, they talk about if you, don't uh, if you don't enjoy your life after 9/11, the media used to say this, then the terrorists have won. Well, I say the same thing. The real terrorists have won if you don't live your life and, and enjoy it. Um, you enjoy your time that you have here, and there, if you burn yourself out with just arguing and bickering, and, and I mean with activities that really do nothing, that don't take you anywhere. You know, getting into a an argument on a on a Facebook board with somebody that's just you know. A, it's degenerated and just calling you names. Um, those people aren't worth it. You're never going to convince them anyway. All right. So uh, you need to take care of yourself. You need to look out for your own mental well-being and take breaks when you can. Um, but also just accept that some you know it, it, that we're all together in this. That we don't need to be looking for reasons to to distance ourselves from each other, and we're all on the same side. And there may be. I mean the. And whenever you get any kind of group together, conflicts are going to come up. People have different ideas of what needs to happen, of what kind of strategy you, can, you, you need to take. That's just how humans work. That's how they interact, and that's how you come to some kind of resolution. But you should always remember that the people who are actually doing something about this and speaking out and unafraid to speak out, they're more your brothers than, than uh, anybody else other than your, your own personal family, all right? And so you got to find ways to get along. And you can have fun with this, too. I mean, again, it, it's a kind of a maudlin subject, but uh, you can still just enjoy the camaraderie that you feel with, uh, with other 9-11 Truth activists as you're doing your work, and you can try to have fun with it. I made a cartoon. You know, we were talking during the break about uh, cartooning, and I want to get back into it. I made a cartoon for a friend I sent out. It was a cereal box, and uh, it was uh, you know, just a kind of a joke of like cereal we could market saying uh, microspheres. And then I had like the little uh, uh, the mark in the corner that they have. It says, Iron Rich, you know. So it's a little inside humor and stuff, but you can have fun too, you know, within your groups. Um, obviously, Iron Rich microspheres referring to the, uh, the controlled demolition evidence. So, I mean, uh, basically, you got to find ways to enjoy yourself while you're doing it, too. And it's not because you don't understand the seriousness of the situation. It's just simply because you need to preserve yourself, too, because you're needed in this fight. So don't burn yourself out, especially arguing with idiots. I mean, that's essentially that, that that's what it, it amounts to. And I think that they put this out there, just like you stated, simply to keep everybody bogged down in their own BS. All right. But you got to rise above it. Right, and by the way, it doesn't mean I. I don't think that there's you know weird technology or anything out there. I just, 
they're uh, you know I, I'm not even getting into the 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 the, the particulars of that. It's just there's certain, and I, I shouldn't call everybody that uh, has seen uh, Doctor Wood's book uh, a cult member or anything. I, I don't mean everybody. I don't want to sound like I am you know throwing a uh, an ad hominem an attack out there. I, I actually shouldn't come off like that. I should be. I should set a better example. So slap on the wrist for myself in front of everybody here. That's me slapping my own hand. But the, the problem is there are people, and you know what? Now, I, when, that now that I even say it out loud and I think about it, it could be they could use that angle. They being the powers that shouldn't be to come in and infiltrate from, and and you know, go, oh look, I'm I'm one of these people, and blah blah. You know, because they're gonna they're gonna come at you from one angle or another. So who knows? I mean, a lot of those people could be not even real people that even have read her work. So I I, I should go a little easier, but the, I just use it as an example. Uh, is what I really meant to do was try to show two different sides and that people need to stop arguing amongst each other because if we don't get along look the reason they get us all arguing over everything i mean the most minuscule stuff whether it's race politics anything about you know not even in the, the truth community itself but as a whole race politics sex religion right the four things that everybody's not allowed to talk about Really? It's all, shh, don't talk about it? Well, the reason we don't talk about it is because if we talked about it, we'd work it out, and then they wouldn't be able to control us with it anymore. That's why you're not supposed to talk about it, okay? If we just talked about it and aired all this crap and stopped, there wouldn't be all this hush-hush, well, talking, you know, blah, 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 and there wouldn't be all this animosity amongst each other. I mean, we allow ourselves to be controlled all the time, and if we keep fighting then each other, we're not going to get anywhere because we're going to be too busy arguing amongst ourselves to be focusing on the real problem. Which is them. Yeah, and you know, I always say this too with people who have different ideas on but what took down the towers in Building 7. I mean, one thing that everybody can agree on is it needs to be investigated again. I mean, I, that's the simplest bare bones common ground that you can find is regardless of what you think brought it down. Obviously, it's not what we've been told. So that's something that uh, you know, we can unite on and, and push for a new investigation. And there you go. And in a real investigation, we get to the bottom of that. So... There's my, uh, there's my, my Well, that's, my the, the, look, again, it's a murder investigation. You know, over 3,000 people died that day, and, and to, when they say, oh, you're disrespecting people by talking about it like that. No, you're not. That's the stupidest thing in the world. That means that then you watching the first 48 is disrespectful to every one of those dead people, every separate murder case, all of their families. You watch that stuff and eat popcorn. Oh, my God. You know, so and so killed so and so. Why? Because he was sleeping with so and so's wife. Oh my God! Blah blah, blah 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 blah. You know all that crap, right? You know all the crap that's. I, and I, when I say the first forty-eight, it's because it's real murder investigations. You know, I mean, you people watch that crap on TV too, the fake stuff. But they'll watch the first forty-eight, which is real murder investigations with a camera crew following detectives and stuff around, right? But then if I – that's okay. That's not disrespectful. They're up in people's business. They got people crying, family members crying. They're all up in their business, right, showing pictures of the dead person. That's, well, they, that's they okay. Make, they make horror movies uh, about – BS ghost stories like Amityville and they have a real person a real little girl who was shot to death portrayed as walking around with a hole in her head forever for eternity in this house I mean you know give me a break with that also too I mean people want to say that it's uh, disrespectful to the victims and the people that were there I have a firefighter on the show it's a pre-recorded show but he's, it's going to air tomorrow he was there he was there when building 7 came down he lost friends he gets emotional in the during the interview just even think about it um, um, all the firemen friends that he lost that day, and he thinks about their their children that are still around. But I mean, he knows it was a controlled demolition. I mean, he knows it. He was there. He saw the molten metal. He saw Building Seven come down. He talks about that. So I mean, that little card that the the other side has tried to use that doesn't really work on me anymore. That's kind of blown away, um, and I don't even see them citing that uh, anymore either. Um, you know, I've had victims. Uh, family members on my show I've had people who uh, had family members that were in the towers uh, have called in the C-SPAN um, it's absolutely not disrespectful it is a murder investigation and the only way that you uh, get to the bottom of what happened is by constantly looking into it look, let's just play devil's advocate let's just say that uh, physics stood down on 9-11 and the official story makes sense that the government just completely failed us and that these uh, 19 hijackers were able to take down the towers and hit the pentagon and do all that stuff all right fine but it still represents 
the greatest intelligence failure in our nation's history. So the American public has every right to be asking questions for at least the next 100 years about this event, and they deserve to have their questions answered over and over and over again. All right, Just as if somebody had left the barn door open and all the barn animals went running out and trampled the fields, and now the farm has no, no food to sell for the next uh, selling season. All right. Uh, whoever left the barn door open has a lot to answer for, and has a, and the the rest of the people who were affected by it have every right to remind him of that as as time goes on, because that he failed in his responsibility. So the American people deserve to have their questions answered. Um, that's just me taking the the devil's advocate uh, position there. But even if it was just an intelligence failure, it's still a failure, and so they don't shouldn't have a chip on their shoulder. And I say they, I mean these government officials and politicians. They shouldn't have a chip on their shoulder when people ask them basic questions, especially when the official story doesn't make any sense. And I guess I'm driving it home to reality now because it doesn't make any sense, um, and we got a major, major problem here in this country. But so even when you look at it from an official story perspective, uh, the, the other side's uh, mannerisms and responses aren't warranted building okay. seven is a red flag for one big reason like the, the official nist the, you know their their official report says and then a miracle occurred and i'm quoting nist and then a miracle occurred so only on 9 11 did three buildings fall that let no just like separate building seven by itself for a second all three of those buildings somehow defied physics and the official NIST reports – see, that that's why the first two, okay, they came out pretty quick from NIST, but it took forever for NIST to release a report. But the, even the report – and I should have plugged this earlier. We, we've had uh, Tony Zambodi and other uh, people doing Freedom of Information Act requests. Uh, you come to find out that NIST left key structural uh, parts of the building out. In, the, in their own analysis that's come out now. And uh, William Pepper has gotten involved. He was the guy that helped uh, uh, bring the truth about uh, Martin Luther King, the assassination of Martin Luther King to light. He's gotten involved, and he's written to the Department of Commerce uh, Inspector General about this. So, I mean, even the, the, the report itself is flawed in that respect because when you actually correct – the parts in the in the report that they screwed up, and uh, you can get a greater analysis on that by going to 9/11 Blogger and, and looking this up, looking up under uh, Tony Zambodi and his great research with uh, with all of his uh, crew there. Um, when you actually look at it, it renders their collapse explanation impossible. All right, but no silence. They don't want to deal with this. Um, and they're forcing the issue, but you're liable to hear more about this come out. And we're keeping on top of it on my show, 9-11 Freefall, as new information comes out. But, I mean, every which way you look at it, the, the whole official story is, is completely uh, – just has so many holes in it. It's like Swiss cheese, just like the 9-11 Commission report, um, everything having to do with this event. So – um, here we are, you know, 13 years later, and we talk about the state of the 9/11 Truth movement. I think it's still plugging along. It's kind of like that, that that point in a Rocky fight where where things kind of slow down, and you hear kind of a, a noise like you're underwater, you know, before the music starts up again. We're still punching, we're still fighting, and we're making gains. And the other side doesn't know what to do about it. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next couple of years. But even if we don't get uh, uh, 9-11 was an inside job on the cover of the New York Times in the next couple of years, it doesn't mean failure. We've completely, radically transformed uh, America's mindset and you know, at least a, a portion of it. And that portion is growing more and more uh, all the time. So you know, you got to keep punching, keep on getting the word out and uh, something will happen. Roger that, Andy. We got about uh, we got about a minute and a half left. I want you to go ahead and plug all your stuff again and plug any upcoming uh, A and E events or anything you want to throw out there for them. Great. Um, okay, so my my show is nine eleven freefall nine one one freefall dot com to listen to the archives. No lies radio dot org. Great station there too. Other great shows on that station um, to listen to it as it plays on Thursday nights, 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific. Uh, for AE, we got a Richard Gage is going to be speaking at the Community Church of New York on May 24th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, it's going to be at 40 East 35th Street uh, in New York City, a $10 suggested donation if you can to come listen to them. And uh, if I'm there, if I'm there, Come up and say hi to me. I want to meet you. I want to shake your hand. Um, it really, we 
regard to other events going on, um, that's the only one I know of at the at the current time. We also have the High Rise Safety Initiative going on. You can sign up uh, at highrisesafetynyc.org uh, to receive regular updates on the campaign and know what's going on with that. And I'm not sure what they need for volunteers or any kind of donations, but the web page gets into that a little bit. And so, uh, you know, if you want to help out. Um, let them know, and uh, and also volunteer with AE 911 Truth. Again, if you have a talent, we need it, no matter what it is. Even if your talent is uh, doing math, you know we can find something that you can do. Trust me, or you can create your own. So. Awesome! Thank you for coming on, Andy. All right, thank you for having me, ladies and gentlemen. Check his radio show out. I urge you to listen to it. Download the archives. Go help out. Architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. As I always say, the solutions to our problems are an inside job. You are not alone, and you are not helpless by any means. I love you all. We're out of here.